So let's give a warm welcome to Professor Lorenzo Fiermonti and hear more about his expertise on GDP and maybe also the theory of the Republic of Wellbeing. Well, good morning. Ah, uh, you can do better, I'm sure. Let's try again. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. There you go. Much more exciting. We do this every day. I come from South Africa. I've been living in Africa for 15 years. And this is common practice, you know, like to greet each other with passion, you know, like, you know, as Julia was saying, we have lost the capacity of actually being emotional and intimate with each other, which is actually what keeps us warm, even especially in Sweden with, what, five degrees outside. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having a full house. And um, I'll talk about numbers, and, um, and my task will be to do it in a way that you don't fall asleep. It's, 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 it's quite hard, but I think I'm perfecting the art of dissimulating the boredom of numbers. So my talk is, um, the name of my talk is that, what do we really talk about when we talk about growth? Right? We hear about growth every time, growth, growth, growth. Companies talk about you know, the imperative of growth. What the hell is growth? You know, we don't really know what is growth. It's one of those you know, terms we use, empty signifiers. We just use it, when you don't know what you say, you say, you know what, the problem is you need more growth. You know, you, there is no content to growth. And you know, I'm going to demonstrate to you scientifically that that is the case. So what is growth? Right? Let me give you an example. What do you see in this picture? Right? This is a picture coming from where I come from. And uh, you see probably zebras. But depending on how you look at the picture, you see very much the opposite of the zebras. You see success, or you see calm, you see beauty, you see peace, but you see danger as well, right? You see you know, a, you know, the aggression, the potential, the perils of something which is lurking behind the zebras. What kills the zebras? So depending on how you look at things, things change. This is also scientifically demonstrated. You know, these are Jupiter and Venus. Just a few weeks ago, Jupiter and Venus overlapped for a few days. You could actually stare at this guy from my home, and it was a beautiful experience. It doesn't happen that often. It happens about every 50 to 60 years, right? Jupiter and Venus have this incredibly beautiful paradox. The Jupiter is many times bigger than Venus. And yet, when you're staring at Jupiter with your naked eye, it looks smaller than Venus. If you use a telescope, that's what it looks like. Jupiter becomes bigger than Venus. Now, an old man who was born in the country where I was born, this guy here, Galileo Galilei, was the first person on Earth that saw this, this paradox. He knew that Jupiter was bigger, but actually, when he invented the telescope, he realized that, how come that I take the telescope off and Jupiter looks smaller, and only when the telescope I put in, it looks, it looks bigger, as it should be? And scientists only found the answer a few weeks ago. It's because of our eye. It's because of how our eye has been designed. We're more susceptible to see brightness and darkness in different ways. And the telescope that we use takes that thing away. So then we see Jupiter the way it is. The same applies to growth. You know, when you're looking for growth, you don't do it like this. You don't go like looking for growth here or there. So, is there any growth there? Can you check for me, please? If, if anybody has found growth, can you bring it back to me because I need some? You don't, this is not how growth, you don't, you know, like, looking for growth doesn't work like this. It doesn't exist. <laughs> it depends on the lens you use. It depends on what is in front of your eye. It depends on the telescope that you have. And if you have a different telescope, you see different growth. And the telescope that we use nowadays in the world is called GDP. Gross domestic problem. Remember, from now on, every time you hear GDP, you say, oh, the gross domestic problem. If we do that more and more times, people will start you know, you know, feeling embarrassed and will stop, stop using the term. If we describe it as a problem, it's a broken telescope. It's giving us an idea of something that doesn't exist, which is actually creating more problems than what we think. 
The problem is not with growth. Growth doesn't exist. It's the telescope that allows us to see growth, which is broken. So let me give you a bit of a history of GDP, OK? Just so you get a sense of, you know, you know you've, all of you have heard about GDP, but often you realize that even the experts know so little about GDP when it was invented, when it was introduced, you know, and why, and so on and so forth, which is interesting for us, because it explains why it is broken. GDP has been around for about 80 years, OK? It was invented during the Great Depression, at a time similar to the times in which we live at the moment. You know, crises and so on and so forth. But it was perfected because of this thing, the Second World War. The Americans, the American government, used GDP as a war planning tool. They needed a way of surveying what companies were producing in order to prepare the war. And that's what you need, you know? It's a good system. If you want to bomb, Europe, you need to know how many bombs you're building, right? And you need to know that you need to be able to project the forecast how this would evolve in the future. So it's a good war planning tool. I would say, if you want to plan a war, use GDP. That's the, it's, it works pretty well. You're getting a sense of how much damage you can, you know, like, create, you can, you can um, impose on another country, and it helps you plan the damage accordingly. This man here, well known as well, lost the war not only because his army lost the war, also because it didn't have GDP. He didn't know how many bombs he was producing. He didn't know how many you know, like armaments his own country could produce. He had his, own, his, his vision. He wanted to conquer the world. He never knew that actually his country couldn't afford it because his companies could not produce as, much, as many armaments as he wanted them to. So that's why, among economists, we call the GDP the Manhattan Project of Economics. Just as important as this thing, two things that were very important for the Americans, to be the first to develop the nuclear bomb and to be the first to develop GDP. Two clear tools to win a world war. Then, you know, in 1944, people gathered in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, in the US, and they planned the global economy. They're still, the global economy we still have nowadays, the very same global economy, 22 days, by the way. When they tell you, you cannot fix the economy, you cannot change the world because it takes too long, you have to tell them, but these guys did it in 22 days. How is it possible that they could do it in 22 days? And they imposed GDP as a measure of success all over the world. So that's when GDP went out of the United States and became the benchmark of success for Sweden the benchmark of success for Europe, the benchmark of success for Japan, and so on and so forth. The communists didn't agree. They had an even worse measure, actually, for all the intents and purposes. But during this period, interestingly, if you think about what was the fight between communism and capitalism about, it wasn't about the moon landing, it wasn't really about the armaments race. It was mostly about showing the world which economic system could bring prosperity better than the other one, right? It was in comparison. But what happens if your idea of prosperity is measured differently than his idea of prosperity? So what happened during about 30 years, from the 1950s until the 1980s, the Americans and the Soviets started fighting over GDP. And in the United States, the best experts of GDP became these guys here, the CIA. So you think of the CIA as a bunch of people like, you know, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie in that film, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you know, like good at martial arts and handling guns, or 007 kind of people. 50% of the CIA staff were statisticians. Three glasses like this, boring, hunchback, you know, full of dandruff, very boring people. Because <laughs> their job, the most important job, was to discredit the economic news coming out of the Soviet Union. They use GDP to tell the world that the communists are not as prosperous as you think because they're using a different telescope. With our telescope, they look smaller. And that was very important because by discrediting the economic growth of the Soviet Union, they told the world, don't go communist, become capitalist, right? And the Soviets were doing the same. This went on for 30 years until the Soviets, for different reasons, many reasons, you know, gave up. And they reached out to the CIA, went to Virginia, where the CIA headquarters are, and said, can you please teach us how to measure GDP? We're tired. We can't continue this anymore. And the, the CIA said, yeah, no problem. Come here for free. We'll teach you. This was in May 1989. Just a few months later, communism came down. So GDP in five months did what everything else couldn't achieve, the fall of communism. That's my argument. It was 55 months of GDP was enough to bring down communism. 
And, and then we, are, we entered the phase in which we are now, in which GDP became by far the global measurement of success. We are all competing to look more and more beautiful in GDP terms. It's like a beauty context, right? And now there's virtually no country in the world that doesn't use GDP as the major uh, measurement of economic performance. Bhutan measures GNH, of course, as we've seen, but even Bhutan, also if you look in between the lines, also measures GDP still, because they want to be seen as, as an acceptable economy to other, to other countries. So they feel this GDP pressure, whether they like it or not. And this became so strong in this continent, where we are. In 1992, the European Union said, you know what, we're going to champion GDP so much that we're going to integrate it into our treaties. So now in the European Union, when GDP goes down or stops growing, they send in the technocrats to fix you. The Greeks know this very well. The Irish, the Portuguese, the Spaniards, the Italians. Mr. Berlusconi, our former prime minister, fell off his chair, thank God, because of GDP. <laughs> So, Europe championed GDP growth at all costs and said, democracy, if it doesn't increase GDP, democracy goes, GDP stays. Whatever you vote doesn't matter anymore. Whatever you want doesn't matter anymore. It's part of our constitutional system, so strong. The International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, went out there convincing the rest of the world, training people how to measure GDP. It became the beauty context of the entire world. The G7, what is the G7? It's a GDP club, so is the G20. If your GDP grows, you get access to these important rooms of power. More recently, the BRICS as well. In 1999, when you and I were celebrating the end of the millennium, you know, jumping around on the 31st of December, on the 31st of December, 1999, the end of the millennium, we're all celebrating. At the US Department of Commerce, they threw a party to celebrate the greatest invention of the 20th century. You can check this. And it was for GDP. And it was a very smart party because they said GDP helped us achieve what nothing else managed, which was to basically standardize econ economies all over the world. Whether you're a communist, whether you're left-wing, right-wing, or whether you believe in God or not, it doesn't matter. All our economies are the same. They work the same thanks to what is the measurement we use in order to, to grow them. And then we entered the phase in which we are. Climate change, in, you know, environmental destruction, CO2 emissions, you know, the, the clean-up costs of environmental destruction, but also the social costs. We're seeing this more and more of this um, in our daily lives all over the world. As I said, 15 years have been living in many so-called developing countries, and they feel exactly the same. There's no difference. You may have a lot of money in your bank or less money in your bank, this life still sucks. And, and then the economic recession, the economic crisis, that was caused by GDP as well. You know, like the increasing debt that was accumulated in our, by all of us, mostly the American consumers, in order to fuel economic growth, actually became a bubble and hit back. And when it burst, it created the economic crisis we're seeing. So this has been the short life of Mr. GDP. And now we're here building consensus on why we need to get out of GDP and move on to something else. But what is this magical number? And here's where some of you may fall asleep. I see a couple of people there. Just try to open your eyes a little bit wider. And here it's mathematics. Are you survived? You're surviving. OK. So, but this is just to say it's a measure of consumption and production. And it only measures money that flows. So if, I, if you sell me your, your, you know, your pen and I buy it, GDP goes like, bing, bing. Then I go like, I don't like it. Can I sell it back to you? Yes. Bing, bing. You say like, what about this? You, we sell things back and forth. Every time we do this, GDP goes up. It doesn't matter whether it's a fake transaction, and it doesn't matter whether it's the real value of what we buy, because it only counts the price. So the price is what makes the value of things. And this is very problematic in many regards. Let me give you some examples. I could, for instance, I have two kids. So I, what I do, I hire a babysitter to spend time with them while I go bowling, while I come here even, while I go out, I don't know, and go to the movies and so on and so forth. GDP goes up because I'm paying the babysitter. But if I say, you know what, I really like my kids. Let me spend some time with them. Let me do what the babysitter does, but let me, the father, do that. Well, I perform the same service, but GDP doesn't take notice of that. 
If I produce my own food, for instance, or alternatively, I go to the supermarket and buy some plastic stuff made in China, which has flown from far, so that each and every little step increases GDP. In the first case, I'm producing something I know, but I do it for myself. GDP doesn't take that into account, although I am actually eating the same stuff or eating better stuff, but the second time, it actually goes up. If I cook for myself, every time we're stupid, because every time we have dinner at home with our families, our economy suffers. We have to stop spending time with our families. Let's please do that. Stop spending time with your families and go out and go to a place in which the food is as crappy as possible because behind crappy food, there are transa hidden transactions that matter. And GDP takes that into account and you become economic heroes. If I do this with my wife, okay, GDP doesn't take that into account. And you say, well, it's a good thing. You know, that's a private stuff. But if I do this, <laughs> if I do this, GDP does take that into account. You may say, yo, prof, you're full of mmm, you naughty boy. Look at this. European Union has decided that sex, drugs, and other, let's say, private things will now be counted as part of GDP. It's a new thing last year because we want to show our economies are not as bad as we think. <laughs> so we hope that at least the prostitutes and the drug dealers will help us bring up our GDP. Okay, this is official news. So I'm not joking, okay? So all of you that have, you know, pay for certain services, feel proud of it, do not hide it anymore. <laughs> so everything that is fenced counts for GDP. If you go to a public park and you don't pay a ticket to get in, that thing is not good for the economy. But if it's fenced and privatized, then it is. If I grow a tree or a million trees like the Bhutanese are doing, that doesn't count as part of your economy. But if you chop them, sell them, and burn them, of course it is a good, beautiful thing, because then it counts for the economy. What is new counts, what is used doesn't count. So recycling, reusing, fixing, bartering, exchanging, forget it, that's bad. Throw away and buy new. That's what GDP wants us to do. And what is free, of course, never counts for GDP. Everything we've got for free. So you may say, is really GDP so popular so let's make, let's, let's try, let's see something. I've done this a few months ago. If I put GDP, this you know, very secretive cryptic acronym on Google, using one of the, web, you know, one of the main browsers, browsers in the world, if I'm sitting in the United States and I put GDP in inverted commas, it gives me 36 million hits on, on Google, right? You may say, is this a lot or too little? Let's see. If I put human development, it gives me 5 million hits. So GDP outweighs human development as a topic on the internet. If I put honesty, it gives me 21 million hits. If I put well-being, it gives me 27 million hits. If I put climate change, again, 7 million hits less than GDP. Can you believe it? An acronym so popular on the internet? It is, of course, not the most popular thing. You know, democracy, 37 million, but just by 1 million you know, hits. Democracy is more popular than GDP. Happiness, of course, very, very popular, 74 million hits. Freedom, still, you know, still in vogue on the internet, 165 million hits. And of course, what is the most popular thing on the internet? Thanks. Why are you laughing? <laughs> You're there in the back. I can see you. So this thing here gives me 799 million hits. <laughs> now, but what is the news here? Is that for, if you do the calculation for each for each person checking GDP, there are 20, only 20 people checking sex on the internet. So that tells you, you know, like, you know, it's still you know, quite, quite significant. Even among scholars and scientists, GDP is way more popular than corruption, inequality, economic growth, governance, climate change, well-being, gender, in, gender inequality, gender equality. All of these are from, taken from Google Books. So the books that we produce, most of the times, talk more about GDP than things we really want that really matter to us. So GDP growth is the current normal. GDP growth is what you are designed to achieve. It's like it's become part of our, the way our organisms are functioning. And, but look interestingly at this quote. And again, I only use, I, make, I made an effort to use only official declarations by official organizations. The OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. This is the rich people, okay, sitting in Paris. If there ever was a controversial icon from the statistics world, GDP is it. 
It measures income, but not equality. It measures growth, but not destruction, and ignores values like social cohesion and the environment. Yet governments, businesses, and most people swear by it every day. So what happened in 1997? Well, 1997 was a tough year, because uh, I was born in 1997, in 1977. So uh, now you know how old I am. But that's not the only reason. Because in 1977, is, this is what our research tells us, is when our GDP growth fundamentally shifted from our growth and well-being. You may say, you know, the reason is that I was born, and it may be true, that's to me, that's me, 1977, you see the two curves, GDP keeps going up, the black curve, and our progress starts going down. So this is a system that we call the decoupling. Our progress and our GDP did not continue. And we measure progress in terms of the things that really value, you know, the well-being, but also the income that we generated, but minus the costs of what we have to pay for, right? And it started going down. And then you had this lady, Maggie Thatcher, telling us, we got the right solution. We know what we're doing. These two guys, they, they presided over a decade that if you read any history book, tells you that it was a decade of high economic growth. But the data that we have, that which, which we have published, and in books and papers, tell us exactly that when you start deducting the costs, social and environmental costs of that growth, you go negative. So we were not producing anything, we were destroying things. And the same applies to environmental damage. Again, here it's me, 1977, I was born, look at the curve, it goes down. <laughs> so the day when I was born, our planet started you know, crippling and going down and down. So our environmental damage became so significant that when you deduct the, the damage to the growth that GDP was producing, it became negative, starting going down. Although, you're told every single day that the golden 80s, the golden 90s, these were times of high economic growth, of high prosperity. It's a fake. It's not true. It's just that GDP does not calculate what we should calculate as part of our prosperity. And here again, you know, the GDP curve going up and the biocapacity of our panel planet going down, basically we're taking resources out of the planet, we're selling them, and we call it progress. Again, GDP only goes up with uh, CO2 emissions. CO2 emissions and GDP are pretty steady, nicely linked together. So one thing that we know for sure is that our CO2 emissions grow exactly like GDP. GDP also fuels inequality. Again, look at our beautiful curve. GDP grows, inequality grows, and we know this all over the world. Again, the OECD published reports that nobody read, and in which we knew from the 1990s. Now everybody talks about Thomas Piketty, but actually his book on capital in the 21st century, but I'm surprised because we knew that already, but nobody wanted to listen, okay? And who were the GDP champions during this phase? Have you ever seen this island? This island is called Nauru, and it's a beautiful small island state in the Pacific. In the 1980s, um, this, they found this thing, in the 60s actually, which is uh, phosphate actually, technically speaking, but just to make it clear, it's bird's poo. Now, bird's poo can actually be used for a number of chemical applications. So Nauru, that beautiful island, became a GDP paradise. They started digging and dinging the poo out of the ground and everywhere and so on and so forth. And this became, guess what, in, 19, in the 1980s, the richest country in the world. GDP per capita in Nauru was the highest in the world in the 1980s, okay? Three times higher than the GDP per capita of the United States. But then what happened? This. GDP growth generating you know, uh, paradoxes, a champion in obesity, diabetes, the world champion in diabetes, and now that the phosphate are gone, there's only destruction, there's nothing left. This is what Nauru looks today. It's got nothing, it's a failed state. The only source of income was by her building a prison, well, a camp for refugees that the Australians did not want, and they put them in Nauru. Another champion, California. California, you know very, probably know very well that up until a few years ago was the sixth largest economy in the world. Its GDP was higher than Canada and Italy. But it wasn't a state, otherwise it should have been a member of the, of the G7. It wasn't a country. 
Okay, so we know these pictures, right? You know, Beverly Hills and so on and so forth. But what's happening now? It is one of the states that is most suffering from climate change. There has been droughts for the past few years and more and more coming. This is before, that's after. This is before, that's after. This is before, that's after. They're considering rationing water in one of the wealthiest parts of the world, thanks to GDP growth. The Chinese miracle is the other one. You know, we all talk about China, how beautiful China is, how great it is, and so on and so forth. The whole world has been staring at China. Some of us were saying, this is wrong. You're not looking at the right picture. No, shut up, you doomsayer, always. Well, the Chinese miracle has become more and more this. This is what is left. Can you see the train? Because I struggle. There's so much fog. And it's like, it's, it's the fastest train in the world, but you cannot see it. <laughs> Look at that. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful, apparently beautiful skyscrapers. If you open the window and you don't see any, anything, not even your hand. So this is a picture taken from the satellite of China. That's what is not in GDP, or one of the many things that are not in GDP. According to the Lancet, the Global Burden of the Seas Research, 1.2 million people die in China every year for pollution-related causes. And this is a, you know, a term that has become more and more popular these days, air apocalypse. People do not want to live in China anymore. Up until a few years ago, I'm an academic, many of my friends were flocking to China, saying that here's the future, salaries are so good, you know, we can deal with the mask a little bit, now they're coming back. Because they're kids, then they have kids, and they go like, I'm sick and tired of having kids having to check the app to see whether they have to wear which type of mask. It's not just one mask or another. Depending on the level of particulate in the, in, in the air, you have to wear different masks. And they have an app for this, apparently. So this is an interview I had with the, minister, the deputy minister of the environment. The deputy minister of the environment, not the head of Greenpeace. Okay, This is a member of a communist party. And he says, this miracle will end soon because the environment can no longer keep pace. Environmental damage has cost China 8 to 15% of GDP per year. Without considering the depletion of the resources, our country has lost almost everything it has gained since the late 1970s to, due to pollution. Are you reading what I'm reading? He's telling us that China doesn't have the money to fix itself. That if it wanted to fix itself, it would need to get all the money back from all the Chinese people since the 70s, since Deng Xiaoping invented you know, like the new Great Leap Forward, had to take the money back. He said, sorry, we gave you the money, but you have to give it back because we have to fix this, and probably we don't even have enough money for that. And we call this a miracle. And now the economist that has been celebrating China for so long, you know, I like the economist. It's the best job in the world. You say one thing one day, you say the opposite tomorrow, and nobody cares. And he's selling millions of copies for having said exactly the opposite. So after celebrating the big dragon, the great dragon, the dragon, and the dragon, and the dragon, now the great full of China. Now they, they're saying what we've been saying for so long. So to me, a good metaphor is, that's why I call it the gross domestic problem. You can call it the gross domestic poo, the gross domestic, whatever you know, like. But it, it's basically, it's like selling organs to make money. You know, if you sell your kidneys or your whatever, it's like initially when I sell my kidney, I feel I'm making money up until I go to the doctor and he's going to tell me, you're, gonna, you're really in trouble. But during that period between selling and going to the doctor, I feel rich. That's what GDP does. It postpones the day of reckoning by a little bit of time. <sighs> the good thing is that shift happens. So things are changing. And, um, you know, Mr. Sarkozy, the former president of France, was the first to realize that, my God, I'm in trouble because I'm increasing GDP, but then I have the environmentalists getting upset. I'm decreasing GDP, then I have, you know, like, workers getting upset. What do I have to do? And Cameron in the UK, Mr. Obama, they all came together, Ban Ki-moon, and started saying, GDP, there's something problematic with the GDP, GDP. please help us do something. And, and we have seen a number of commissions and research, and I've been involved, Julia was involved in some of the initial um, gatherings at the UN, I've been involved in many others trying to rethink GDP, and by rethinking GDP, also rethinking what growth is. Because that's the issue. It's not about GDP per se, it's about the fact that GDP is how we see growth, it's how we see prosperity, it's how we see development. And, you know, like we've been talking about Bhutan, but there are many other examples around the world of different attempts at changing the way in which we see development. Even, as I said, even conventional mainstream organizations like the OCD have started producing something like this your better life index, in which you have something seems copied from the GNH of Bhutan. 
you know, housing, income, jobs, community, education, environment, life satisfaction, safety, and so on and so forth, different dimensions of what life is all about and how you can measure them in different countries. Our research shows, interestingly, you know, everything you do in your household, at home, doesn't count for GDP. You cook for yourself, whatever you do with your kids, whatever you could do within your own community, doesn't count for GDP, even though we know that it's the backbone of our economy. Without that one, there wouldn't be any economy to begin with. Those of you that are business people, think how much it would cost for you to treat your workforce, to deal with your workforce, to Google, so there are some Googlers here, how much would it cost for Google to train, to potty train their employees? It's a lot of money, I suppose, right? You have to thank the moms that did it for free when they were in their households. It's a metaphor, it's an extreme, but it tells you how much our economy owes to what we do every day at home. Without that, there wouldn't be any economy to begin with. And actually, when you start measuring the value of that, you know what happens? That, sorry, that what we do at home counts almost as much as what we do outside. Look, in the UK, 80% of growth is actually done at home. So if the housewives were to claim their money, their share, they could go to Mr. Cameron and say, what is our GDP? Well, 80% I have produced, give me the money back. So what we do at home is actually so important. And yet our laws and our rules disincentivize, disincentivize us. They sort of punish us when we do that. You know, like punish the house husbands, the housewives, the people that want to invest in their communities. And the other thing that we do is that we know more and more that we are producing so-called GDP growth at the expense of our natural resources. You see the graph, every time the gray one goes up, the green one is going down. So we're not really creating wealth. And this is from the United Nations again. We're not really creating wealth. We're simply substituting one type of wealth for another one. So we're not, we're chopping a tree and we're selling it, but we didn't make the tree in the first place. It's not something we have created. We're simply replacing it for a bunch of money. But there is hope. We're seeing more and more the rise of people that are trying and movements and states and governments that are trying something different. Beyond GDP has become more and more popular in the United States. At least three states have introduced genuine progress indicators. Vermont, Maryland, and, and, and Massachusetts as part of their um, policy planning. Because remember, for as long as your GDP tells you to do certain things, it's going to be hard for you to say, we need to focus on well-being, we need to focus on, we have to change the rules and the systems, and we have to find ways of measuring these new things so that they become relevant for policy making. You know, like, um, this is in Maryland, from the Maryland's website. Uh, even the European Commission, after deciding that now sex and drugs should be part of GDP, you know, somebody with a bit of, you know, uh, brain decided that maybe that's not acceptable, we should rather focus on something else, and they're now considering deducting the costs of environmental destruction and social destruction from nominal GDP. So at least to see which countries are really growing and which countries are not. Like Nauru. If Nauru had done that in the 1980s, they would have certainly stopped that, 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 um, that trajectory. Paraguay. Paraguay in 2013 decided to use well-being as their national measurement for economic policy. Okay. Uh, we have seen Bolivia, Bhutan, of course. We've seen Ecuador integrating the rights of modern nature in their constitutions or in their national laws. So you give nature the possibility to go to the lawyer in case you're trying to abuse it. Because we have created a system whereby our counterpart, the planet, the future generations, don't, do, they don't have any rights, right? So they said, what about we do this so at least Mother Nature can take us to court when, we are, when we're building a dam where we shouldn't, when we're stopping the river, when the river has an important ecosystem service to produce. Even the Chinese are now taking a U-turn. Um, now we know, finally, officially, what we have been saying for so long, that the Chinese GDP was inflated. This is an official declaration interview by the head of the Chinese Reserve Bank. Our GDP, he said, was man-made. So they, it, there was somebody there on a computer saying, it's, it's 10, let's make it 15 tonight. Okay, 15, and everybody was like, oh, China, China. And next week was 16 and 17 and so on and so forth. 
GDP was m actively manipulated. But why was it manipulated? Because the poor Chinese wanted to show the world that they were so successful. Because they needed something. GDP nowadays has become our business card. You know, you go there, it's like, how good my GDP is. Can you believe it? And go like, oh my god, I'm so envious. How can I get the same GDP? Come to me, I'll tell you. So that's become, so the Chinese are, were suffering from this sort of profile that they had, and they had to keep up with the expectations that the Chinese were really growing their GDP. And they got to the point of simply faking the numbers in order to do that. But they have decided to start introducing other measures as well. Green GDPs, they're not perfect, but at least they give us an idea of the fact that if you sell your organs and then you have to pay for the doctor, you may want to deduct the costs before you sell your organ just to get a sense of whether it's a good deal or not. And the, the president of China said, we need to st stop obsessing ourselves with GDP. This is the president of China, Xi Jinping. Officially, in 2013, said, our officials are obsessed with GDP. It's like with, you know, with companies, when you're obsessed with your performance, with your, with your profit uh, figures, and so on and so forth. The same applies to politicians. They go like, how big is your GDP? Mine is bigger, so I'm going to be promoted. You're going to stay behind. We have to stop obsessing with that and move on to something else. 70 cities in China last year decided to drop GDP, including Shanghai, to drop GDP as a measure because it's taking them in the wrong direction. And they want to start measuring different things in order to be able to build a different type of city, a different type of economy. 2015, it's almost over, but I still think it's our opportunity because of this post-GDP, post-2015 conversation and so on and so forth at the United Nations, more and more people, groups, businesses, governments, civil society organizations are coming together to design a different world. You know, this is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Have you heard of them? Because I'm so sad because we're all there celebrating and then we realize that you know, nobody knew about it. Volkswagen somehow, somehow you know, swept the whole thing away and everybody knows about Volkswagen. Nobody knows that in, in New York they were signing a new agreement, global agreement on, on a different development trajectory for the world. This is an article of ours that was published in The Guardian with some of my colleagues, including Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, who published the book that Julia presented, was data coming from the book that Julia presented um, earlier. We published a piece in The Guardian in which we argued that we have to stop obsessing with GDP economies and start building republics of well-being. What does it mean to build a well-being economy? We need different rules. We need different laws. We need different systems of governance. We need to have people that spend more time at home. I mean, I have to celebrate Sweden for reducing your work day to six hours. I mean, you've done a great job. I mean, like you're showing now that economies can prosper and can actually even increase productivity by having people stay more time at home and spend time with their communities, with their own families, and so on and so forth. We have to do more and more of this. We have to have governments that are willing to take a leap and say, we have to stop this vicious circle of self-destruction, which GDP is encouraging us to do. I've been arguing that we have to stop this obsession with the G7. The G7, it's like asking the worst polluters to fix pollution. It's like doing exactly the opposite of what Einstein tells us to do. These guys are celebrated as the global leaders for what? Tell me, what is that makes these guys the world leaders? Especially the guy over there, the Prime Minister of Italy, you know, because I think, you know, honestly, Italy shouldn't even be part of that. But in any case, what is that makes them so much? We look up to these people. Let me tell you what these people are. They are the worst polluters. They are the most indebted nations in the world. They are, uh, some of them, you know, also uh, war criminals and so on and so forth. So why do we have a system? Only because these guys have the GDP flag to wave. If we take away the GDP flag for them, maybe countries like Sweden, maybe countries like South Korea, Costa Rica, Bhutan, should be there. We should look up to Bhutan, Costa Rica, Sweden, South Korea. With all their problems, New Zealand, these countries have tried to do something in a different direction. But our system of global rules is rewarding the bad guys rather than the good guys. So my argument is that we have to start building well-being economies and maybe even have a club of well-being economies that get together and try to support one another since they're a minority. We have to stop GDP. We have to stop talking about GDP. We have to tell people GDP sucks, you know, build, make yourself a t-shirt like uh, GDP, you know, GDP sucks, GDP really is a problem, you know, like, or putting yourself, it, it, just walk around and people at some point will take notice and will say, like, what is this, what is this, wow, I mean, I didn't know that, you know, that really is bad. At Google, you can walk around with GDP and no GDP shirts, 
Google has a lot to gain, actually, uh, from you know, a non-GDP economy, but I don't have time to tell you that. I can tell you privately to the Googlers. <laughs> so for so long, and here I conclude, for so long in history, we believed the world was flat, right? So it, for millennia and millennia, an idea that was absolutely dead wrong was the prevailing idea. Like, we laugh, but people died because scientists like me died because they found that it wasn't flat. And yet the system did not want people to know. Now, GDP, thank God for a more limited time of a period of time, is doing us the same thing. We have been told that we can grow indefinitely. We can pollute and produce and consume and produce and consume without, you know, endlessly, although our planet has planetary boundaries. It's like believing in God. It's like, don't worry. This is the economist. The typical mainstream economist is like, he's like a religious leader to certain extent. It's like, don't worry. You must have faith. Somebody somehow will fix this. You don't have to worry about it. And you keep going like, but is it normal? And do not worry about it. You have to have faith. And scientists have been saying more and more times that this is not working. This is not working. Climate change is now telling us it hasn't been working. And, and I think, you know, Galileo, the same guy of the telescope, once had a, was taken to court. It was taken, uh, had a trial uh, by the church because he believed that it was planet Earth to rotate against, around the sun and it was rotating and spinning. But the church could not accept that, although he had all the evidence. And yet, he had to, come, he had to accept the church's version. So during, in order to save his life, he had to say, yes, yes, of course, you're right. The, it's the sun that is rotating around, around planet Earth, and the planet Earth is flat, and it's not moving. And I love this quote that he, you know, but leaving the court outside, records tell us that he said, no matter what I've said, and yet it moves. You can tell us how many times, with all the power, the strength that you want, that GDP growth is the way to go. But just like the planet was rotating around the sun, science and good conscience and wisdom tell us that it moves, that GDP cannot grow forever, that GDP is creating the damage that we see around ourselves, that it's creating the things we don't want. And no matter how much how powerful those that want to deny this are. We're getting to the point in which we cannot accept it anymore. And I see you know, the, the, the contestation versus the, against the idea of GDP growth, similar to the contestation against the flat planet. And by doing this, we're simply allowing ourselves to see the truth. And the truth is that our GDP growth is not just unsustainable, it's undesirable. And it's just like Galileo and other guys have done nowadays, we are the generation that can change the things and help the planet become what it really is. Thanks. Lorenzo for President in the Republic of Wellbeing. Here, here. My God, thank you for giving uh, such an insightful and sincere picture of a very cynical world that we live in. I mean, how do you foresee, um, we've all seen your presentation and heard your words, how do you foresee this change really happening? I mean, what are the criteria, the cr critical steps, legislation, regulation, but what are the steps that also, for example, people on a daily basis can do? Well, I think, you know, this is what I call the sandwich model, right? The, the sandwich version. I think change doesn't happen one way or another. It happens when different things come together. Just like you cannot make a good sandwich with only one ingredient. And, and what you need is somebody waking up at the top level. And people are waking up, but they're scared. Mm. They're scared because they say, you know, I speak to presidents at times, and, or, and they go like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I had a conversation the other day. Oh, I shouldn't say the names. But anyway, so at some time I say, like, we get this, we get this. It's like, you know, science, it's clear. But if I say that publicly, things will really go bad for my country because investors will pull out. They're going to tell me that I want to change the system and so on and so forth. I need other 
people, other governments to join. So you need visionary leadership to connect at the top level. But then you need pressure from the bottom. You need these theaters to fill up everywhere. You need people to realize that if we do not destroy GDP, as boring as it may sound, you cannot build a better economy because this system is like a monster. It's going to eat whatever you do. So you need this pressure. And then you need these crazy academics in between and don't mind losing their credibility by going public with all the things that I've said and, 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 and simply you know, arguing and arguing. I get my salary anyway, you know, right? no matter what I do. So, and, 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 and you need this kind of things to come together. That's the sandwich. And then you can shift. And I still believe three months we still have of 2015. That's the year in which we can trigger the change. But we really have to join forces and push the leaders. Some leaders are there waiting for pressure. So we need is to put them together. And I, yeah. You illustrate quite a lot out of a society perspective. If you would also put the business perspective into it. Yeah, I think, I think business is a major role to play. And the first thing I have to be very outspoken here is that business leaders, businesses in general, have to think whether they want to be the champions of the past or the champions of the future. Now, Volkswagen is a very good example of being the champion of the past. Look what happens. You have to be able to foresee where you want to go. You know, GDP for, for, for an economy is like profit for business. What do you mean by profit? A company which is highly indebted, which has a frustrated workforce, that is actually living on natural capital or natural resources that are common property, is not a profitable company. This thing cannot continue. We have to build profitable companies. I'm not against profit, but we have to measure profit properly. If profit is about generating new ideas, generating value, shared value, and so on and so forth, these companies are the companies of the future. We have to, and I think there are many businesses out there that would have an incentive at creating rules and mechanisms that can finally show us a different idea of profit so that the old companies die out and they will have more and more market shares to occupy. But some of these old companies are using GDP in order to hide their own um, wrongdoings, their own problems, and still look good like most of the fossil fuel industries. There's no way to show that an oil company is a profitable company because the damage that it creates to society that it doesn't have to pay for but it should outweighs whatever money they make. So this system should change so as to allow the good companies to prosper and to simply put the bad companies in the book of history forever. Wow. Yeah, I mean, we need people like you <laughs> in politics. Um, and, and a bit like you're saying, I mean, knowledge is power. We're getting knowledge. So I, I, it's really important that we also endorse what you're saying on our own level and, you know, spread the word, spread the word of what you're saying and sort of break this illusion of, for example, um, the GDP and highlight G&H instead. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Lorenzo. Thank you.